Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Woodworking Wisdom. Today, we are carrying on with um, a basket weave illusion project. Um, a lovely little uh, kind of thing that Colin got started yesterday. Um, and what it is basically is a, is a bowl or it could be any um, kind of turned item. And he's used a, a, a fluting parting tool or, a, um, or like a, a bead forming tool um, to create lots of little rounds on the bowl, which we can then divide and, and color to, to make it look um, like, like it's been a, a weaved basket. Um, I'm keeping it quite simple today. I'm um, trying to keep it simple for, for these demonstrations. Um, you know, so you get the idea um, and then you can take this any way you want. And there's loads of different patterns and stuff that you can use. Um, and we'll show you where to get the, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, templates and stuff like that. Because it is quite, um, you, you really want to pre-plan this. Um, we want to to make sure that the, the 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 pattern or however many segments you've got on your pattern that the the pattern kind of flows into one another and and you know so you don't get kind of halfway around the bowl and you realize there's an overlap in the pattern things like that so we're, we're going to show you a little um you know a few tips on that i um, got a little bit of pyro to do um so this is involving pyrography as well um and that's, I think, that's how it got handed over to me. Um, so, um, just like always, um, pop your, we're, we're live today. Um, pop your questions in the chat. And we've got the lovely Steph on the, on the questions and cameras. Um, she's going to guide us through and, 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 um, and ask your questions for us. Um, okay. So, first things first, there's a little bit of pyro left to do. So let's come in on um, on camera two here, Steph. That'd be great. That, there we go. So if you remember yesterday, this come off the lathe, it still has its little sacrificial foot on it, and we've got some pencil marks on there because we're going to uh, rechuck this and um, get it on those, those big wood jaws or the button jaws, and we're going to um, remove this foot, and that gives us a chance to sand this area as well. We have our pencil lines, which Colin kindly put on yesterday using that, um, that flat table and using the indexing on the, um, on the, on the lathe spindle. Okay. Um, now, overnight, we've had a question. Um, we had a question from Chris about um, the faceplate and um, that he doesn't normally do up the grub screw on the back. Now, normally on the back of the faceplate, there's um, like a, a back boss, so a, a piece of metal which kind of brings the, the actual faceplate itself away from, you know, the, the spindle. Um, and it's important that that is tightened right to the back of the register on your, on your thread of the spindle so that, that, you know, so that that thread really grips. Now, because we only have 36 um, indexing places on our, um, on our lathe, um, Colwyn just rotated that through half of one of those um, kind of indexing positions, if you will, and then tightened up that grub screw. So that the, the, um, the faceplate is just presented in a slightly, you know, kind of off from, um, from the back of the register. So it's crept forward just a tiny touch on that thread. Um, but he was only doing that to mark out, and that's quite important. We don't we when we turn the lathe on, if we're turning or if we're doing any of these beads or cutting any shapes, it's really important that that um, that faceplate is up tight to the register, and that's what offers the friction onto the um, onto the thread and holds the workpiece safely. Okay, so please be careful if you're, um, you know, if you are changing uh, the position of that faceplate, we don't want, you, you know, it, it's really important you don't turn the lathe on and then it gives it a chance to kind of um, to move. Okay, so a bit of help for the safety there. It's just for you there, Chris. Um, but not normally, um, we don't normally do the grub screws up, um, but it, for that, to, to fix it in position, um, and that was just for the marking out. Good. So where are we at? Um, we're going to do a little bit of pyro first. We've just got a few lines to do, and I want to show you this. Okay. So we've got this section here. You can see I've burnt in all these uh, what I call radial lines um, coming off of the um, 
off of the the bowl here or the bottom of the bowl um i've got my pyro pen i've got the fire writer here and it's got a sharp tip in it okay um i've shown you how to make these we're just hammered flat and um and sharpened on a bit of abrasive and it's just that little round wire um but you can see it's got a flat on it and that's important we want to keep this this line nice and sharp and we want to cut into the piece of timber so let's just get you into a place where we're we're focused on camera there great so i'm up fairly hot i'm just going to take that down it's just below eight now because i want to burn fairly deep and we're just going to pop that in there we're going to roll and then get right down into that little valley between the beads and really kind of force that pyro tip in there. I want to make sure that line is kind of scorched right the way to the bottom. And I'm kind of drifting off a little bit there. But that's fine. So this is a basket weave illusion. I'm going to put my excuse in early and say that, you know, not all baskets are, you know, perfectly um, divided like this. Um, and important, you kind of get over the top of the project. I'm just going to bend my tip back a bit. It's just creeping one way very slightly. So just bending that back into position with a, a pair of uh, jewelers pliers. So you can see how that's working. I've producing a fair bit of smoke with this because we are burning very deep. Um, we're producing a bit of smoke. Now I've got my little um, charcoal filter on um, the uh, on the side there, my um, my filter, and and that's taking away all the the kind of solids out of the air um, and getting rid of kind of you know a lot of the smell of the smoke. Okay, so we've got our first question. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Oh, Steph, we've got um, we've got a little message on screen on camera one. There is there anything we can do to um, just set that? Sorry, bear with us. One of our cameras is is telling us a message here. That's better. Thank you, Steph. Okay, thank you. Oh, great. Yeah, good stuff. So we've got a question from Robert Smith. He's saying my indexing is twenty-four positions. Yeah. So, this is a very good question. So, where we're printing this um, this off, first of all, you'd have to use the divisions on your lathe. So, you'd, you'd use 24, you could double that to 48, which is great. You know, you're still going to get a, a, a good amount of these kind of radial lines coming out of the, the middle there. And, and as we go out on the diameter, they're going to turn into more like um, uh, rectangles which it does in a basket weave so that's totally fine you're just going to have bigger um bigger sections now the graph paper that we're using to plot this out let's let's have a have a look at this then steph so let's go on um to camera three yeah that's perfect so i'm getting these off of um a, a website that colwyn actually found it's called printablepaper.net okay and the um the the uh, round pattern like this is called a, a polar graph. So if you go onto printablepaper.net and um, and search on, on their different categories for polar graph paper, you'll see this pattern come up. And this has got it in all sorts of different divisions. There's you know there's bound to be a, um, a forty eight or or what you know whatever it was that that um, kind of suits the divisions on your indexing. Um, <clears throat> Ours is 72, so we found one with a 72 um, uh, segments, okay? And, um, you know, I've been quite into this kind of ancient earth thing at the moment, and 72 is a number that comes up a lot um, in the Mayan calendar and things like that. So you could probably bring some inspiration from that if you've got a number that has, a, you know, a certain value or something like that. Um, so, you know, really interesting um and and easily available online um that is printablepaper.net okay but you'll just have to find um the one that's going to suit your um your lathe and your kind of indexing system really okay 
Perfect. So I'm sorry, guys, you didn't hear me because I forgot to turn my mic on then. So that was Robert Smith's question. So you can find that in the chat. Uh, the second question is from Bill. He said, when you say force the point in, how much are we talking about? So it needs to get right down into the bottom of this valley. So let's come back onto camera two. Um, where we've got that bead forming tool, they, um, you know, that it's actually quite deep in there. And the shape of the tip is quite important. If it was something rounder, um, it would never reach down the bottom. And I've kind of filed away, not filed, but um, used a bit of abrasive to shape this tip and um, just get so it gets right down into there. The pressure, um, you know, I, I use a fair bit of pressure, almost like as if you were cutting something out with a craft knife on a, on a kind of medium um, card. So we're using that kind of pressure like you're almost trying to punch through. Um, so we, it, it's like very much like using a craft knife. Okay, so another question. Yeah, so we've got a question in here from Graham. He said, can you modify the tip so that it's like a U, so it's like a razor tip? You could, actually. That's a great idea. Um, something I hadn't thought of, but you could um, get a piece of um, material, um, a bit of the, the wire, and, and bend it into that U shape so you've got almost, almost two prongs on the side and a U shape. Hammer that out flat. And you'll be um, you'll be right in business. What a great idea! Thank you. Maybe one for the future. I'll I'll, um, I'll look into that. And um, Frederick said to you know a good tip potentially for to divide a segment into three on a 20, 24 dividing head, and you'll get seventy two. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So that that um you know you can break it down lots of different ways. You can kind of um you know divide it by three and you'll also so you might want to use a little bit of math i had to get a calculator out earlier to divide this and to find out how many squares i need for a set pattern um, so you might be reaching for the calculator at some point um, to, to see you know if you wanted a pattern say you wanted um, a sets of diamonds or something like that um, to, to know how many diamonds you can fit into 72 you just um, you know divide it by as you know whatever number um, I think I've gone into um, into eight here, which gives us a um, it gives us nine um, nine squares per kind of quarter of the bowl, if you like. So if I was to draw a triangle that was kind of nine squares um, across, um, then I know I can repeat that pattern and just have it go around the shape of the bowl. Okay. Perfect. And Bill sort of said, leading on from his about the pressure of force of how far you're burning um so about enough to snap a pencil like the pencil yeah point. that sounds about right yeah yeah so if you were to to push down and it would be about that pressure where the lead snaps yeah it's a good way of um of thinking of it um take your time with this like i always say um you know this is um you know, you don't want to rush this. Um, I've I was rushing a little bit this morning, and I've um, I put the reds in the wrong place on the other bowl. Um, and it's really easy to do when you're looking at a grid like this um, to miscalculate one. And once that stains on there, it's a real um, you know a, a bit of a, a um, chore to get it off. But you could use um, a carving tool or something like this if you wanted to really kind of separate these beads, give it that kind of really strong woven look. Um, you could take a little V tool down some of these lines and, and perhaps open them up a bit. Um, but it's the pyro that's going to stop the, um, the stain from bleeding. Okay, so you would still need to do a bit of uh, pyrography. And it's really easy to kind of drift off this line. So just make sure you're kind of concentrating and get over the top of it. So you're kind of looking down the line of the pen, if you will. So we get how that works. And what we're doing um, is 
burning right down into that little um, that little kind of valley. And remember, Colin yesterday used those um, wedges to kind of score down in the bottom there. That is also doing the same job as the pyro. That's um, kind of sealing the timber and stopping it from um, from for the the stain from bleeding too much. Okay, so you can see how we've we've filled in this area now. Um, and that's the kind of grid done. And now it would be to kind of plot out whatever um, kind of pattern you would like. Now, again, going back to the graph paper, I've tried all sorts of different patterns, and I'm going to show you a couple. Um, that you know, This is kind of what we're going to go for today, almost like chevrons. Um, but practicing on this side with different um, kind of layouts and, and, and patterns, I've got some more over here, which were a bit more colorful. Let me just grab them. Excuse me a moment. So looking at kind of patterns like this, um, just checking colors against one another. Um, and to be fair, um, you know, we want to keep it simple for, for a live demo. Um, but if you've got the time, you know, you can really experiment with some of these patterns and, you know, fold your piece of paper and that can give you kind of instant quarters and you can kind of work out the spacing between each of these kind of features um, and start bringing in other kind of patterns in behind. So, you know, really print yourself off a few of these. They have got loads of lines on and what I tend to do is just mark off the um the amount of squares that we've got so i've done a ring in the middle here which is kind of representing this bit um and i've done an outside ring at eight um segments which is the number of beads we've got on the back of the bowl here okay so i've marked this up i've also put some little division lines on the quarters um and it, you know it's starting to look like a a kind of ship's wheel or something like that is you know, you'll start to notice patterns and you could perhaps tease those out of your um of your design um <clears throat> but yeah this has given me a really you know if you if you can work out a pattern in one of these segments then you can repeat it all the way around and you'll get that lovely kind of look to the bowl okay so another question so uh martin's asked what heat setting you're using on the Pyro pen. Heat setting. So I'm just under eight, which is quite hot for me. Um, I tend to work um, just below seven usually, um, but I really wanted to kind of scorch into the timber or, or cut into the timber. Um, so I've I've ramped up the heat a little bit, um, and consequently that produces a bit of smoke. So um, an open window with a fan to to kind of drag it away, or like this little. Um, thing we've got an air filter in here which kind of draws the smoke to it um, and those carbon filters take out the the nasty stuff okay another question so fuller has asked um on the paper template do you color in the pattern first i do yeah i kind of if i'm using different colors um i would color it in um and i've got a red biro and a pencil which i've been using to kind of plot out um, what I'm doing, because I'm using black and red um, spirit stains as, as uh, you know, to, to, to use. So it gives you a good idea of, of how they're going to sit next to it, how they're going to kind of look. But yeah, um, color it in and, and kind of work it out. And, and like I said before, I've only um, kind of worked this pattern out on a quarter of the bowl. But because it's, um, you know, it divides up equally, um, that pattern will, will repeat itself around the whole of the bowl and it should um, you know, all meet up uh, nicely at the end. Okay. Frederick's saying that he's, uh, Frederick Rowland is saying that he's loving the demo. And the only problem is it costs money and you end up buying more kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. He's on to us then. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, you know, you don't have to use all these things. Um, you know, there are there are options with, with coloring. You could use uh, paints. You could, um, you know, the the I think the you know the the big expense in this is the is the kind of lathe and um, and all that business. Um, I haven't got a lathe at home. Well, I've got a tiny lathe at home. 
um, but quite often we can, you know, lucky to be able to do some turning here and, and take it back. Um, and and also we've got two world class turners here, so very very lucky we're we're spoiled in here. So I get to pick up these bowls and stuff almost well. It, it, it's kind of um, you know it's it's readily available here. Um, okay, so a spirit stain. So I'm using. Let me just show you this. This is the um, the Chromacraft. This is the um, Nick Hagar. Um, series uh, wood dye okay uh, really nice stuff really nice deep black on this again i said it before some blacks have a, a, a slight blue tinge to them but this is a really nice kind of jet black um but it's not kind of shiny either it's got that lovely matte look to it so i'm following my little um my little design here and we want these kind of chevrons coming up and again i've divided this into quarters and i've also extended that onto the bowl blank okay so you can see some extra lines here and they're really going to help me when it comes to kind of plotting this out and um and seeing at a glance where i'm at with it okay so we're carrying on with this little um, this little lineup here. I tend to um, <clears throat> follow these diagonal lines. Um, uh, they do sit side by side on certain ones, um, but we're going to uh, work our way through this. I'm just kind of orientating myself. I'm working on this quarter, okay? And that's really important. And what I would do is stick to it one quarter at a time. Rather than um, you know coming right the way around the bowl um, for for a pattern that repeats itself like this, um, just take it one segment at a time. Something like that's fine. A spiral because we're really just going on diagonally to one another. Um, so that you know looks really nice and effective. Um, but I thought we'd have a go at a different pattern. And you know to be honest, we're new to this as well. This is one of your suggestions. Um, so we're kind of finding our feet with it at the same time. So let's come on to our, um, our camera too there. That's great. Thanks, Steph. So what we're trying to do with this, um, this ink is come right down the side of the bead. We don't want to be showing any of that kind of timber. Again, not much product on the brush. We're just keeping it nice and light. And Oh, sorry, I've put the lid on. Let's take that off. So I'm dipping in the bottle and then just removing the excess on the bottleneck. Um, normally, I wouldn't go straight from the bottle. I'd, I'd decant some out, um, but I'm only using black with one black brush. Okay, I'm not going to um, come in with the red and dip that in there. Um, so there's no cross-contamination going on. So this is my line here. And we're following these little segments. Just checking that you guys can see that on camera. Um, now, I haven't got the most steady of hands. And you can see this is a little bit fiddly. So what I tend to do is bring in my other hand for a bit of support. So I can push on this hand um, and, you know, sort of stabilize the, the hand that's holding the brush. Okay, are we good there in focus? And what you'll find, there's a lot of this going on. Fairly time-consuming um, project, but it's, um, you know, it's got such a lovely effect. Um, you know, it's a real good payoff at the end. So using that thin section of the brush to get right down into that little kind of valley at the bottom there and then just bringing over that color. I've got a couple of hairs here that are really annoying me. So I'm going to just pluck them off, pulling them down and to the side because they will mark um, other ones. Don't want to come off, so I'm going to use a little bit of heat with my pyro pen and just singe that off there. 
Good. A couple of little flyaway hairs there that were touching on and um, causing me grief. So just trim them off with a sharp knife or pull them off if they'll come off. Um, or whatever's at hand, my pyro machine did a great job there. So I'm just using my um, fingertips to kind of give me that area where I'm going to um, stop this kind of diagonal line coming down. Remember, and get right down into that little valley. And once you get going, you kind of build a little rhythm. So what I've been doing is taking the brush down there, a brush stroke down there, a brush stroke down there. And then I've got that, um, those two little valleys done. And another great product from Chromacraft are these felt tips. And they've got the black stain in there. And if you want, you can do your little valleys and then just come over the top with the felt tip. And that will just speed things up. Okay, so there are kind of complementary products, same dye in this one as there is in the in, in the bottle. Really useful those. Okay, so that's now two segments done. Okay, we've done a quarter of our bowl or two eighths, if you will. So where this line joins. This, where this segment joins this one, we can see there's two black dots next to each other. So I can happily go in and, and just color in this one. If you find you've got too much product on the, on the brush, you could start coming up through this, um, this diagonal. So you can get rid of some of the product there, get rid of some product there, and then come back into your kind of delicate areas down in those valleys. And, you know, we're going to color those segments in anyway. So it's good. Just to get that done. So we're going one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I'll put a little dot on them and then I know where to stop. Okay, so we've got some more questions. Yeah, so, um, so we've got a few. Bill has asked, how painful is it? Uh, pyro burn, pyro tool burn. Ben. How painful, How painful is, a painful is it? It's not too bad, actually. Um, <clears throat> the natural reaction to heat is just to, <clears throat> you know, just let go. Um, so we, our self-preservation will, will stop us from having a really bad burn. Um, but an awful smell, it's, it's like singed hair. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not too bad. Um, you know, you'll, you'll, it might smart for a little, you know, a, a day or two, but... You know, it soon toughens up and, and goes away. And um, so Fuller suggested here that he thinks uh, maybe a set of fine point Sharpies. Yeah. Would be yeah. useful. Totally. And they are um, and they're permanent. Um, this is a, just a porous thing. So you could treat it just like paper or, or card. Um, yeah, I use a lot of um, uh, permanent markers um it's, they're great when you want to just kind of color things in and or, or um you know do do bring out a small bit of detail absolutely you know love those little sharpie fine liners okay. we've got simon here asking um why is it that stain will not build into a burnt line i think because it's just so thin there's no kind of um pigment to it it's not like a paint where you've got a, a high kind of uh, solid content it's um, it, it acts like water, so you can you can put it on. Um, you can kind of build it to an extent where you um, you know the more um, you know you put some on, let it dry, put another layer on. That's really going to kind of darken and um, or, or deepen the color. Um, but um, yeah, uh, something with a like a paint has that heavy pigment that will sit in those little gaps and it will almost fill those gaps. Um, 
so uh, you know my choice would be would be a spirit stain this is a wood dye um but yeah they they work very much the same um really nice and user friendly and also i like these types of dyes and and um and stains and things because you can still see the the grain of the timber under them whereas a paint that's what you're looking at you're looking at that painted surface um yeah okay so a couple of people uh graham and bill have kind of both suggested and i think you kind of did it with a couple of your squares and you were counting up uh to mark out the pattern with a pencil or like a little marker sort of before you get going so you don't get lost yeah so i don't put pencil on because actually it gives it um you can see a little shine under the, underneath the spirit stain um, for a paint. That would be fine. Cause again, you're going to cover that. You won't see through it. Um, but um, I would tend to do it with something very similar to what you're going to use. So if you're going to use um, a, a black wood dye or spirit stain, you could, um, you could use that and just put little dots on things. And then when it comes to filling that color, um, it will be invisible. Um, but a pencil, you will see through this, um, through this stuff. Um, and, and I know that because I do lots of uh, pyrography that's flat um, and quite often use that carbon paper. And if I haven't sanded it back properly, it, I can see through it and I can see it's there and it, you know, it really bugs me. But um, yeah, certainly a black pen, um, not the kind of thick ink biro type, but um, like a, an ink pen like your Sharpies. Um, it's going to do just the same thing. You could dot this out and plot it out um, so you don't get confused. Because, um, you know, let's have a look. I've only done a couple of these now. And I've already made a couple of howling mistakes. Um, so you can see on this one, the red is following this inside of this curve, if you like. And I come across here and I've put it on the outside. Um, so instantly, you know, it's not the end of the world. What we can do is repeat that. So we can put the red on this side, a red on that side, and then we'll skip one. And that will still be a repeating pattern, um, but it's it's not the kind of spiral that we get on, on that side. It would be just slightly different. Um, and it is so easy to do, to kind of miscount one or, and, and <laughs> you know, once that stain's gone on there, it's a real um, a real pig to get off. Okay, so another question. We've got a few more, actually. Um, Robert A has asked, what size are the beads, please? Size of the beads, I think these are, I've got my little thing here. This is about a six mil bead on this, or the six, I think it's, um, I think it's actually, um, imperial uh the measurement on the thing is six point something and it's the crown um bead forming tool um but you, there's lots of um you know fluted parting tools um beading tools there's all sorts of different um sizes and things you can get and ruby is asked uh when you're done what do you seal the work with um so i would always use a finishing oil um it's always my go-to finish um, because I kind of know how it's going to, how it's going to behave. Um, so that's the finishing oil on the back of that one. Okay. Let's come over to camera free there, Steph. Um, there's a finishing oil on there and it's just brought out that timber. You can see it's got, um, a little bit of a, um, a kind of, uh, luster to it. It's almost, um, it's not glossy. It's just, um, you know, got that nice little sheen. On the inside, you can see very much different. Um, I haven't put any oil on this yet because I, ha I haven't finished it. Um, but you can see the color, the kind of um, it, the color change. It really make it pop the oil. It really brings out the colors, makes the blacks kind of um, you know blacker, if you will, and those reds and the and the timber itself. Because um, we've not colored in between here. We've got a black and a red, and then that's the natural color of the timber, and that's kind of bringing that out as well so i always tend to use um a, a finishing oil um, and that's easy to clean up as well again we've got all these little valleys so it's almost like you're um dry brushing it on so a little bit of product get it in there work it around um 
but we don't want to kind of flood this with an oil um because you'll spend forever trying to get it back out of these little um these little low spots and it'll go sticky if there's too much product on there and you can't kind of wipe it back all right and chris sullivan's asked is that libron finish finishing oil um yeah we use the Liberon finishing oil, use it loads in here. We're always, we use it for, for turnings, for, um, I put it on top of all my Pyrex. I know it's not going to upset these spirit stains and, and inks. I quite like the, um, you know, you get lots of people who don't like the yellowing um, that those types of oils can um, can give. But I like the um, the finish off of finishing oil. It kind of makes it almost like an amber rather than a yellow. Um, you get this nice kind of deep, um, warm color off of a, off of a um, finishing oil. Sorry, I got caught in the um, in the spiral then. <laughs> okay. And we've got a question here from uh, Robert Smith. Do you have a preference for a type of brush to avoid hairs coming off? So not really. Um, to be honest, like you, I kind of um, I'm a bit of a penny pincher. Or oh, sorry, not you personally, but um, I I like to um, do stuff. Um, you know, cheap, as cheap as possible, really. And these are just the little artist brushes. Uh, really affordable. You get like I think ten or twelve in a pack, and they come in various sizes. Um, what I tend to do with these stains is I'll designate one you know, I'll have a black one, I'll have a red one, a yellow one, and I kind of just keep using those, um, those brushes for those colors. Um, and that way you're not kind of getting through loads of brushes. You don't have to do any cleanup. Um, as long as they're not in a dusty area, um, as soon as you dip that back into your spirit stain or whatever, um, it is that you're using, that's going to kind of re uh, bring the brush back to life because they they dry quite stiff um but the um the the liquid uh the spirit that it's um kept in uh, will kind of reactivate the brush if you will okay we've got a few sort of comments here as well yeah lovely. bill farrell said there's no such thing as mistake it's a feature <laughs> that's right that's why i've got a black rim on this one bill <laughs> Because I opened the bottle and it um it went everywhere, so we got a new black rim feature on that. Well, <laughs> um, and Fuller has here said uh, rather than using one hand to steady the other for fine work, try a mall stick. I think I'm saying that right with a small foot or feet. A this mall will help stick to prevent smearing paint with or on your hands. I don't think okay. I've ever heard of that either. So that sounds like um, almost like a little stool for your hand, like it's going to be some sort of um, something, some sort of steady that you can put under your wrist. And it's going to elevate your hand off of the work. A mall stand, that's worth looking into. I'm going to write that down. Or, Steph, could you just make a note of that, please? I'm going to Google it in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bill said it's uh, stick songwriters use. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mall is that M A like Darth Mall M A M A U L. -L. I'm gonna like Google it. it. Um, I've got a question here from Maria in Wales. Yeah. Hi Maria. Uh, hi Maria. Um, how long would you leave the dye to dry for uh, before applying the oil? Generally, I'd like to leave them 24 hours, um, but sometimes, you know, we got a demo the next day and we want to show this thing. So um, that one actually, I, I painted it. Um, because it's a spirit stain, that spirit evaporates really quickly. And I just put the oil straight on there, to be honest. Um, probably might have had about half an hour's time to to kind of um relax and allow the, the dries to evaporate. Um, but yeah, I went straight in with the, on the back of that one. It didn't seem to affect it too much. Um, it didn't pick anything up and wash it around. Um, but if you're looking at other products, always read the bottle, read the read the um the um, whatever it is it's, it's um, contained in and that will usually give you some guidance on on drying times and um, you know really I should say give it a good 24 hours but I got away with that other one after about half an hour spirit stains I love these they they dry so quickly and this wood dye is doing exactly the same thing um, really nice products to use 
Okay, so where are we at? We're coming back up with this one. Um, and you'll notice things in this pattern, like we got two, we got a gap of two there. So we know that this one's going to be filled in. Always second guessing myself because um, because the little amount I've done of this, I've found it really pays to take your time before you apply the brush onto the um, onto the workpiece. They're good, um, you know. It's worth taking that little bit of extra time. So you can see it is a slow process, and I'm sorry. This is a bit like literally watching paint dry, um, but it's um it's a nice process. And if you know, if um, we weren't live and and I was doing this at home, I'd be loving this. I'd be in the zone and um, and just taking my time and enjoying the process. But you can see how that works. Let's try add a little bit of red so we get a bit of a contrast. Um, you know, that is going to take um, a bit longer. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out is earlier I was coming up through one of these. Oh, I just put a black, bit of black on there. Let's turn the brush around. Um, I was coming up one of these and I got to this point and I thought I'd actually come back and join up with this one. So always take that time to double check. Like here, I feel like I want to come back down now, but it's not. It's coming up into the middle of our um, indexing there. And in fact, I'm just going to paint that last one in, and then that seems like a natural place to um, to stop. And when I come back to this, it's, um, it's not going to confuse me as to where I'm at. Lots of people here are, are not not sure what instructions are, <laughs> or just adverse to reading them. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's like all of us, I'm afraid. Um, you know, brand new washing machine. I'm sure I can crack it. It's like cracking the Enigma machine <laughs> um, with no instruction. Um, right. So I want to take the lid off of this one. I want to show you how we do it because it comes with this little red bung in it. And yesterday I pulled the black one out and it, like I said, it splashed onto the, the other bowl that I was doing. So first rule, let's get that out of the way, put that to one side. I've got a little um, kind of cloth onto the table so I'm not getting my, my table mucky. And I'm going to use my little uh, flex cut carving knife. This is not what they're intended for. Um, but again... We've got some, we've got lots of tools around us. And this was a nice one that just got in that little um, kind of split, if you will. And I'm going around the bottle, lifting it bit by bit. And then I'm going to use a bit of um, blue towel. And I'm just going to pull that off. Okay. Like I said before, like I took the other one off and it kind of splashed as I kind of mishandled the um, this little bung. Useful little thing that as well. You could decant into that, um, but that's really, um, you know, to help keep that spirit staying in the bottle and stop it from evaporating. It's a little interface between the lid. So your bowl back can come back in now. We've got our lid off safely. Okay, so another question. Yep. Yeah, so, oh, um... so we just lost the camera there. Thanks, Steph. Sorry about that. So we've got a couple of questions. We've got yep. one from Jim. Um, he's asked, if you did make a mistake and colour the wrong square, mm -hmm. how can you fix it? <laughs> you can't really with these stains. They, they really kind of um, penetrate in. Um, you could, what I was thinking, um, it'd probably be better to go in with the red first. Um, and then if we do make a mistake, if we colour the wrong square, we can always colour it black. And then the black's going to sit on top of the red and kind of hide it a bit better where the red won't sit on top of the black. That's all very well unless you hit one of your kind of um, your um, natural squares or, you know, if you've got a different color or a light color, um, then it's really um, a bit of carving. You'd have to carve it back. I wouldn't take an abrasive to this now because 
the dust as well. It kind of settles in all these gaps. It gunks up to the brush, um, and then you're in all sorts of um, all sorts of trouble. And it's a real pain when you get that dust um, stuck onto the brush. It kind of drags and clogs it up. It splits the hairs open and stuff. So um, like this, let's have a little look. Let's come in on camera two. I don't know if we're going to be able to see this. So we can see it here. Um, now I would be tempted. I've got my little carving knife in hand. Let's just make sure I've got none of that red product on there. And, you know, worth using your um, nitrile gloves if you're doing stuff like this. Again, I've got a, a black, black spirit stain where I've kind of um, spilt it. I've got it all in my fingernail now, and it's um, a bit yucky. So this bowl, I can't attack it from this way because it's the, the bottom of the bowl is pushing me up there. So I'm going to bring it around this way, I think. Take it in my left hand this time and just see if we can just scrape that back. Really careful. Give it a little wiggle so as not to cut into that next segment. You could scrape this, I guess, with a little scraper. And it's just not, I'm not quite getting the angle. So what I'm going to have to do, um, let's go on to camera three there, Steph, is bring it to the edge of the table so I can get my knife handle down that a little bit lower. Oh, we're off, we're off camera. Yeah, so I'm going to switch hands to my right. That's better. Let's elevate that handle a little bit and see if we can't just scrape that off. It's not going to give you the greatest finish. But you can, you know, remove a bit of it. And let's come back onto camera two. Although we haven't entirely cleaned it up, it's looking a bit better. And with a little bit more TLC, I'm sure you could get rid of the worst of that. Okay. Good stuff. So, more questions? Well, uh, some other people have come up with some other ideas. Um, Lovely. For the... the um clearing off the square. Somebody said you could use painter's masking fluid on all the plain segments and mm. rub it off afterwards. Yeah. Um, and then Jenny suggested perhaps you could rethink the pattern. It may be easier to add in like a few a few extra squares. Yeah, of course. You can you can change the pattern midway. Um, perhaps you might want to put a little decorative ring around the ones that <laughs> have had a bit of, um, you know, a bit <laughs> that, that aren't quite um, perfect. But I'd given up striving for perfection a long time ago. Um, I would rather make a mistake, push on through, and make another one. Um, you know, I was, I, I am a little bit of a perfectionist, but I find with the kind of work that I do, if I try and strive for perfection every time, it just takes hours and hours and hours. And it takes all the fun out of it. You know, it's less productive. So I tend to, um, you know, almost start again. But with a with a project like this, where you've already done a fair bit of work to it, you know, try and um, try and bring it back where you can. Okay. Frank Smith has asked here, um, where did you get the leather cover for the probe? I think he means the pyro pyrography pen. Oh yeah, Steph brought me that. So Steph, who's asking the question, is also my wife. She um, she got me them for Christmas one year, not last year, the year before. And um, she bought me these. They are well, they were the finger protectors, weren't they, Steph? Yeah, they were so they were leather finger protectors on um, Amazon. I think they're for, meant to be for sewing. Yeah, I remember. And I think I snipped the end off of it. So we're talking about this little piece here. Um, it was a full kind of finger, if you like, like um, almost as if it was a pair of gloves and someone had chopped all the fingers off them. Um, so I just cut the end here and th threaded my um, my cable for my pyro pen through it. So, um, yeah, really nice, soft, um, cuts out some of the heat, um, but it is working on this taper. Okay, this if we come camera three, you can see the shape of this pen. It tapers 
naturally. Um, if you've got something like um, a Peter Childs, um, that's got a straight body on it, and it might, as you're working, kind of slip over the end into the kind of uh, business area, which we know is going to get really hot, um, which will, will burn the leather. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it is working for, for this, may not work for, um, for your pens at home, but certainly for the fire writer, it's a it's a godsend. I was always <laughs> Steph got them for me to actually put on my fingers as um, to protect from the heat because I do some really kind of heavy burnt stuff sometimes, or spend a long time with it, and the, the pens do get hot. Um, so the idea was really to put them on my fingers, but um, again, I felt a bit like it was a bit cumbersome, so chop the end off one and, and put it on the on the pen itself okay so ed wilson here has asked would it be worth the while to desi designate the squares and go back and stain them like paint by numbers um so we kind of do that a little bit with the patterns um so print off these patterns and you can um yeah you can kind of if you wanted to you could come along and dot these um so you've got a little mark on um, one, let's, let's come on camera two. So you could come along, dot here and here. Um, where are we on the pattern? Let me see if I can confidently go along here. So we're going to have reds that are follow under this line. So we can dot here, 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 here. Um, and let's stop there because we're on the quarter. And then we can work that out properly. But now we've got the confidence we can just come in here without kind of working it out each time and just fill in that color. Okay. And you've been found out. Tom Tango has uh, noticed that you've left the lid off of the black stain whilst you're not using it. Oh, naughty. <laughs> yeah, these spirit stains, you really want to keep... Um, keep the lids on them. Like I say, they're so fast drying, they will um, they will evaporate. And we want to keep as much of this this product. We've paid good money for it, so let's um, let's keep the lids on and let's not mix the lids up for that matter. Black one goes back on the black, and the red goes with the red. And that's it, really. It's more of the same. We're we're just coming along these each of these individual squares um you know we'll never get this finished in in our in the time allotted um because it it is quite time consuming but i think you know at the end of it and i'll certainly get this finished over um you know before we come live again and we'll show you the finished article um but we'll never get there today um unless you're free for the next couple of hours really okay you can see that pattern kind of coming to life um bit by bit patience is required don't really need a steady hand as long as you can steady it you could use your um your maul a new word i've learned today uh, or you could use um your your other hand your kind of off hand as a steady and i do that a lot with pyrography also with turning, my other hand kind of comes in um, to support and to, um, you know, push things through. But yeah, you can see that pattern starting to come together. And it's really just repeating that. So you'd start to have a column of black um, squares coming down here on the diagonal where they hit that, um, that eighth mark it would then shoot back off the other way. But take your time, consider what it is that your, um, you know, what your pattern is and, um, and, and just take it slowly. Mark it out if you like. Like we were saying, you could put a dot on each one if you kind of get in that rhythm and, and, and plot it out like that. Have your reference material, your kind of um, pre-designed. And I would recommend, um, you know, making a design. You don't have to come right the way around the, the full template just do an eighth or a quarter of that um that area and you know when they um when they come back together that they're all gonna um kind of 
they're going to work. They're going to sit next to each other properly in that kind of repeating pattern. Okay, so let's put the lid on before signing off. Um, let's get that on there. And like I say, I usually wear the blue blue gloves for this, but I just got stuck in there. Um, but that is, um, you know, a little peek at um, this basket weave illusion. We get some really nice patterns um, going through. Um, and there's lots of different patterns you can choose from, lots of inspiration online um, if you wanted to, you know, check out other, what other people are doing. Um, and these look really nice in bands around hollow forms. You know, it doesn't have to be a bowl. Um, you can really explore this subject and make some really, you know, really lovely patterns, some really cool stuff. That's about it for me. Is there any more questions, Steph? I think we're okay. I think we're good. I, if I have missed any, then um, please do email them into the team here. Good stuff. And like I say, any questions um, you've got, pop them into our woodworking wisdom um, at axminstertools.com. And we do our best to um, to answer those. Um, but that's about it really for today. Um, if you're enjoying these videos, if you're enjoying all this free content, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Um, Thanks again for joining us on another Woodworking Wisdom. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.